Bueno, ahora que todo el mundo... Ahora que todo el mundo tiene ya un poco de fuerza después del zumo de naranja, vamos a continuar con la sesión de la mañana. Eh, eh, quiero dar las gracias a Want to Thank and Brighton, eh, por acompañarnos eh, en, esta, en, este, en este Foto España. Eh, Anne Brighton es la persona que, Commission Manager, la directora de encargos, sería una traducción directa, de la National Portrait Gallery, que ya saben ustedes que es uno de los pocos museos eh, temáticos que hay en el mundo, la National Portrait Gallery, donde hay, eh, donde hay naturalmente retratos y eh, básicamente tienen una enorme y estupenda colección de retratos fotográficos. Eh, bueno, ella eh, en este momento está produciendo una serie de tres años que se llama Camino al 2012 y está unida a las Olimpiadas de Londres, etcétera, a los Juegos Olímpicos, pero eh, ha trabajado en muchos otros proyectos, siempre comisionando, siempre encargando fotografías eh, eh, y siempre, digamos, dentro del contexto del, del, del retrato, con lo cual me parecía muy importante que Anne eh, estuviera aquí en esta edición, pues precisamente por, por dentro del contexto que ella trabaja. Eh, ha trabajado en Londres, en París, en Amsterdam y, y bueno, y sobre todo, pues tiene una amplísima experiencia eh, en la fotografía británica, sobre todo desde los años 50 a 70, esta es su área de especialización, pero como digo, sobre todo eh, desde el punto de vista de, bueno, de, de alguien que está trabajando como, como gestor y como en, en, alguien que encarga las fotografías. So, thank you very much, Anne, for being with us. Uh, and for your patience with the, with the computer, porque Anne es, es usuaria de Mac y la verdad es que los usuarios de Mac con el PC siempre tenemos problemas, pero bueno, se solventarán. You know, we always have problems. Bueno, muy, thank you very much. And we'll... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The National Portrait Gallery in London does. We are a keeper of faces and with the stories that go accompany them. So I was very excited and pleased to be invited to contribute to the story of talks today. My role at the gallery is to commission a series of pho photographic portraits around specific themes. But I want to start by briefly talking about the gallery and the collection and really what we set out to do. And then I'll focus on my current project, which is called Road to 2012. And that's going to be a unique collection of newly commissioned photographic portraits, depicting the people who are working in training to make London 2012 happen. And that is a live project. I'm, it's a three-year project, and I'm just preparing a second exhibition. We did one last year, we're doing one now, and we'll finish in um, 2012 itself. They start in exactly 421 days. I'm very aware of my deadlines. But first, um, the National Portrait Gallery. So I will open up here. So the gallery was first founded in 1856 with a remit that fitted into the 19th century notions of teaching by example. It was to be a gallery of original portraits. Such portraits consist, as far as possible, of those persons who are most honourably commemorated in British history, as warriors, or as statesmen, or in art, in literature, or in science. So, um, a very specific brief and it will come as no surprise to you that the first person in the collection was William Shakespeare, and he was gifted to the collection when the gallery was founded, and it was founded by an act of parliament. The criterion for the collect this criterion is still used um, by the gallery today when deciding whose portraits will be accessioned into the National Portrait Gallery collection. The artist who creates the portrait is important but we are not an art gallery. It's the status of the sitter that matters. So, and this is another quote from um, the early 1850s when the gallery was founded. The authenticity of a portrait and the celebrity of the person represented will be the grounds for the admission of a picture. 
and not its excellence as a work of art. So this really sums up our role. We're a gallery of biography and of history. The sitters don't have to be British, but they do have to have made a significant difference to British life. So all nationalities are... I'm not sure exactly how many, but there are many nationalities included in the, in the collection that will have had some effect on British, um, British culture. This focus makes the gallery very, very accessible. People really love people. And the visitors' figures are just under two million last year, so we really punch above our weight as an institution, certainly with an ever-decreasing um, funding from the government, and the rest is raised by partnership. The entrance to the main collection is free, and this is something that the trustees are really determined to maintain throughout the coming period of austerity. The importance of photography was asserted um, in the late 1960s by a dynamic young director called Sir Roy Strong, and that was really when so much changed across the board in the, in the UK, but especially in um, terms of photography. It was the first push to have photography recognised as an, as an art practice. The decisions about whose portraits come into the collection is made by um, a government appointed board of trustees. And um, we now collect living people as well as the dead, and that didn't change until the 1960s. So for a long time, people had to really have their worth totally established by living a great life, dying, and then being recognised. And now we're picking up on all sorts of people. Um, and we are acquiring them through purchase and gift, as well as by commissioning. And we commission in all media. And the Road to 2012 is the biggest photographic commission that the gallery has undertaken. So I'm going to tell you now something about it briefly, and then I will show you the four bodies of work that we've been commissioning across the last probably nearly two years now. So this is the poster for the first exhibition which opened in July last year. And it's a portrait by Brian Briffin, who was our first photographer. So the, por the, the project. In 2005, when London won the bid to host 2012, the 2012 Games, we recognised at the gallery that we really needed to do something about it and make portraits of the people who were, who were involved or going to be involved in making this happen. It is undoubtedly a unique moment in the history of the capital. What form this record should take was developed over the following three years and the project went live into, at the end of 2009 and with the support of a partner, the global telecommunications, telecommunications company, BT. And that was very important. That enabled us to do it. And I mention that because it, certainly now, the funding is absolutely critical. Um, and also, I want to say that we do hold editorial um, independence. So we listen, but we actually control the commission, or the whole project. It is a multifaceted project. It's, um, we have participation projects with some of the people involved in the five neighbourhoods that are going to be actually hosting the Olympic Games. We have a publishing, uh, we'll be publishing a book. We have a very active website. Um, we're making digital interviews. And the whole body of the work will finally be archived as, as the record. And this is also... Um, new thinking to create, to set out consciously to create an, a record and an archive across many different aspects of the gallery. But the heart of it is the new photographic commission that will really act as the record in the celebration of London 2012. And as a project of this scale, it's absolutely essential that we have a very tight structure and a very clear uh, selection pro process. This has to be more than just a bunch of photographs. We've agreed to make up to 100 portraits, and as 6,000 people will be directly involved in London 2012, we have to be incredibly selective. So we really have to be able to substantiate why we're selecting the people we, we are selecting. So that was a lot of pretty in-depth research. 
The title to Road to 2012 actually shaped the structure. We found that the title was agreed very early on. And the project is actually a chronology of the journey that two groups of people are making along this road. One is, pretty obviously, the athletes who aspire to take part, who aspire to be selected for Team GB. And the selection process won't take place until we have finished the commission, because we have to get it on the wall in time. So this is very much a story of a journey. And if some of our sitters don't make it, that's part of the story of travelling along this particular road for athletes. And the other group of people we are making portraits with portraits of are the facilitators. And these are people that are actually enabling it all to happen. So from the people, the visionaries that won the bid, right through to the delivering of the Olympic Park, the staging of the Games, and the legacy promises that were made in the bid. Each year across the three years, we're commissioning two bodies of work. Each one will be by a different photographer, and one photographer is invited to make the athlete's portrait, and the other the portrait of the facilitators. <coughs> so that, in a relative nutshell, is the project, and it's pretty complex without showing you the work, which I'll now do. But I do want to stress that, above all, this is a story. In the way that the gallery, so much of the gallery's collection is really following people's stories. Um, and ours is a story of an extraordinary, what we think will be, is so far, an extraordinary collective achievement. And it's made up of the many personal stories that contribute to this whole. So these are the stories of our individual sitters and they're told through the portraits and through the interpretation that will be part of, part of this project. And that interpretation includes um, documenting the process of making the work so that each of the, we follow each of the photographers who make, um, I make photographs on the, at, at the shoot. We, um, I do an audio blog that tells the backstories of the sittings and the photographers because in meeting the photographers and hanging out with them, working with them, so much comes up. And those are really revealing and very enriching. And it um, just gives another take on the work that we'll be showing. Um, our digital producer is making filmed interviews of the sitters and I hope to be able to show you one at the end. And these are for our website and also going across various social media sites which actually give us very wide coverage. There's no better way really to um, tell you more than to actually show you some of the photographs that, that are part of the project so far. So each, each year's commission has its own title. The overall project is Road to 2012 and the first year was called Setting Out. And the photographer we invited to work with us was Brian Griffin. And we invited him to make the portraits of the facilitator. Um, so the people who won the bid and the people who were charged with delivering the Olympic Park and all the venues. In thinking about which photographers to use, we really wanted to work with high, both high profile and emerging photographers, men and women, who work in different ways. We weren't looking for a singular approach. We really wanted the rich, a rich mix of visual, visual languages for these portraits. Um, and really a sense of what's happening with photographic portraiture now in the UK. So some of the kind of genres that, that um, are surfacing or around. Brian's been around for a long time. He's very much a photographer's photographer. Um, you may, actually he's going to be here next week giving workshops. Some of you may be familiar with his work. He's the same generation as Martin Parr. They studied together. And Brian made his name with groundbreaking work in the 80s, pretty soon after he graduated. This is called Big Bang, and it was made in um, 1986. And it was a time of economic boom in London. There was so much building going up. And Brian, it was Brian's area. He was very interested in work and the workers, and actually pretty subversive in the way that he approached the photographs of the workers. Um, 
for me, Brian is one of the most elusive photographers working in the UK. His imagery reaches out in so many different ways, and looking at at Big Bang, you can see that the figure standing in front, the worker, the everyman, and for many of you will link this with Caspar uh, David Friedrich, the romantic German artist, um, and one of, someone that Brian really respects and likes a lot. Um, this is made at night, and the explosion in the sky was created by a powerful mortar firework, which was deliberately shot into the air with this extraordinary dramatic yeah, kind of war zone look. And that would be Brian kind of playing with, with what we are looking at. After he made this, he said, I can do anything now. And it was that, and that confidence that, I, that really made us all feel Brian is the person to lay the foundations of this project. And also his subject matter. He had um, continued to do a lot of work around work, and this was from a project made in 2008. It was one of the major engineering projects at the time of linking, rail, linking railway stations, but it went underground. It was a lot of tunnelling. It, um, it enabled the Eurostar to function from somewhere else. And Brian was um, commissioned to make a project of uh, a series of portraits of all the people involved in the project. And I pulled this one out because it shows Brian's ability to make something out of nothing much, I would say. An office, the building, at the entrance to an office, so bland architecture, men in suits, um, what's going on? And yet with the way Brian lights and alludes to other things, opens up so many possibilities and so many readings of the portrait. So um, I was really eager to work with him, both for his strength, the, his, both for his technical mastery, his approach, but also because he combines, and this is what I was looking for across the project, both commercial practice and um, an artist's vision at how to make a series of work, a body of work. And that was incredibly important because the parameters we work within are very much the parameters of a commercial commission. If you think we're asking the photographers to photograph someone they may not have met before in a place they may not have been before. And we, Brian, was given two hours to do this in. It's a challenge, two hours to make a portrait that was of gallery wall quality. Um, and I trusted him. And so much of this commission is about trust. So Brian's brief, I, I realised it's been very useful thinking about this project, uh, the talk, and what, because I realised at the beginning we didn't really have a prescriptive brief. It was, this is Brian's area, we know what he does, we gave him the sitters, and the one thing I asked for, that everything was on location. And Brian and the other photographer this year we're working with, we work with in the first series, Bettina from Spale, were both studio, I would say studio photographers. Um, I asked them both to work out of the studio. Brian is comfortable with that. It was very important from a project perspective that we located the portraits in a time and a place. We have a good collection of sports photographs in the collection, but they're often studio portraits simulated after the event or press. And, um, I'm starting with one of Brian's first images here, which is the ex-Olympians who were ambassadors for the bid. And I put it in, it's the same one as on the poster, but I'm showing it again because it was after actually reading the, I was rereading an Aberdeen quote that was in the, one of the catalogues for um, Photo Spania. And it was from Aberdeen who said, a, and I might be misquoting slightly, I'm recalling it, a portrait is a photograph of someone who knows they're having their portrait made. And what interested with that was the recognizing how Brian takes that, takes that self-consciousness, that awareness of being photographed, and really heightens it. He waits for a moment, and he freezes the sitter. And so there's both that aspect, that ploy, so to almost cast them as sculptures, and to this he adds really exaggerated what he calls digital rendition. He's photographing digitally. So, 
this portrait for me really summed up some of Brown's methodology. And the other that is so much part of his work is the use of visual references from across, across, across different disciplines. Um, he was watching Jean-Pierre Melville films at the time. And so there's a real sense of intrigue to this. And you can see we're on location. And I've been able to caption where we are, and it's a, a venue for 2012. But he, it's one of what Brian calls his non-spaces. He looks for corridors, for um, air ventilators, just straight, slightly strange places that he can light and make something happen with his sitters. He doesn't preconceive before. We did locate all the majority of the locations before, but he doesn't create his portrait or know what he's going to do until he's met the sitters and seen their physicality, how they relate. And um, he thinks. And sometimes it's that two hours he spent probably up to the first hour thinking. And the sitters know each other. So on the whole, it's relatively relaxed. And we all aware they'll be leaving on time. They're busy people. So this is Brian at the Olympic Stadium. I'm just thinking about what he's going to do. And this is when the sitters arrived. There were three of them. For the venues, we invited the architect, the engineer, and the construction director. Um, I was very clear that we should have all three. The architect in the UK always has priority. And this is so much a team effort. The architect is the man who's holding up, not leaning against, he's got his hand up. When he arrived, he embraced one of those great steel girders, my building, and Brian picked up on that. And it's often one thing that Brian picks up on and then builds the portrait around that. And here you can see the final image um, with the architect with his, with his hand on his building and the construction director in front and the engineer from a young gun next to them. And this is at the beginning of 2010. So at a point in time when the, the stadium was still um, being built. And it's important to have that in the collection. Um, these are the three people that led the delivery of the Olympic Park. Part of the collection of gathered material is um, listening to people talk when I'm on location. And this quote comes from the Olympic minister, who was very, told me a lot. And I, I held on to it. I write them down and I put it with the captions. So our captions also have kind of sub-stories. Um, another way Brian gets his sitters, pulls his sitters together and I tell you this because Englishmen don't touch, so there's a real difficulty in bringing them closer than this. And I know the distance exactly, because I've observed it so often. often. So the rock in the hand is important. The location is important. It's where the aggregates were transported into the Olympic site. But they weren't comfortable, and they really didn't want to be there. They wanted to be at work. And it was when Brian said to them, he, said, he, he positioned them, and he said, you look heroic. You look like 1950s airline adverts, which is big time and change in flight. And they rose to that. They became heroes. And this again is um, one of my favourite images. Brian works so formally, he crops in the camera, and both he and I delighted in that finger of the mayor at the time, Ken Livingston. It's perfectly organised. This was in City Hall, but again, it's a very neutral neutral background. It just forms a lovely shape for them to work within. It was Ken that said, I was born in the 50s, I don't touch. But they were very comfortable together and they knew, they were very savvy, they knew, as we did, when something had happened that would make the portrait. Brian um, spends a lot of time in galleries, painting and sculpture really a part of his extraordinary kind of visual database. And when I asked him to make a group portrait of five sitters, he went to the National Maritime Museum to look at, just to look at the paintings generally, I think, but he found this one. He was looking for his lighting, 
How do you light and arrange five people and make something happen? And this is the portrait. And when these people came in, I looked at them and wondered, how do we bring such disparate people together? As Brian said, if you don't have Kate Moss, if you don't have a top model, you're already on a losing wicket. And I felt this was going to be tricky. But Brian looked at them and he said to Margaret Higginson, who's a disability officer for London 2012, You've got a beautiful fur collar on, Margaret. And I knew he'd build a portrait around that and around her. And it was positioning those two men at the side of Sentinels. And um, the woman who was um, head of procurement, the blonde woman, so um, very unusual to have a woman in that role, leant over and I found a lot of biblical references in Brian's work. It almost, I felt there's something about the way she was leaning and whispering into the into Margaret's ear, and the two sentinels either side. And it's when the man on the, the, yeah, the left put his hands up like that, we knew we got it. And we, then we, we said, Brown stops them, and, and, and this, the image happened. Um, another, another important reference, the most, but the first portrait we made was by four young ambassadors, school students who had all lived in the five boroughs uh, that would host the Games, and they were part of the bid team. They went as part of London's delegates. And this was probably a very winning part of the bid. Brian, Brian deals with power and men in suits, so to photograph four young people was really quite a challenge for him. And he recalled an image he'd seen heads on one body and he said to the sitters when he met them I'm going to photograph you as four heads on one body because you as a collective have made London 2012 you've brought London 2012 to this country um, and it was difficult and it didn't work but Titian didn't have that many heads and an even number with everything is always quite difficult. And it was only when the sitters felt relaxed and they were really working with us, it was pretty uncomfortable, they were balanced on a table, that the young boxer leant out. And it's that, it's the sitters' engagement with Brian and with what's going on that sometimes make, creates the image. Um, and again, collecting their stories. So, so I'd just go back to this. I said we'd be photographing some of the unsung, as well as what we colloquially call in England the great and the good. So these would be, these are people that would not normally be in the collection, as are the soil engineers who um, were responsible for cleaning and recycling the, all the soil still being recycled, on the majority of being recycled in the park. And you can see there some of the soil, they're almost like moles underground, that's how Brian was reading this, and the um, stadium. And finally from Brian, um, a portrait that I feel again sums up our narrative. This is Jason Kenny in the centre, and he's a young gold medalist from Beijing, cyclist. And he comes from a family of steel workers. Three generations of steel workers have worked in Watson Steel in the north of England. And Watson um, won one of the contracts to provide steel for the Olympic Park. So what we have here is Jason's father and his uncle, Mick and Mike, at Watson Steel. And it is a, a story of, of huge achievement, uh, both from the unsung, this family, this family of steel workers and Jason himself. I'm going to move on now to the second photographer who worked with us um, in the first year, and her name is Bettina from Israel. We're not we're using photographers based in, in the UK for logistical reasons. Access is very difficult. And although I try and block together the sittings, it's not possible, especially with the athletes. 
they have training schedules, they have competition, and we can wait a very long time, and it's sporadic and difficult. So Bettina's a um, German photographer, she, she, she was an apprentice in Rome, where she worked with an architectural photographer who did 10 by 8 for, uh, architectural shots. And she then came to the Royal College of Art in London. And she is a conceptual artist. Um, this is one of, one of her diptychs. And it's an ongoing project. So I actually challenged myself to go outside someone who was working commercially very early on in the project. And there was a reason. Um, once we kind of set down our, our ground, our foundation with Brian, and actually I realized something else I didn't add was very important. In, our, in choosing Brian to be the first photographer, we were really putting down our marker. Portrait photography is art and it can be challenging, and Brian's work was found to be challenging. Um, and once Brian was in place, I, I was more aware of what we were working against and what we might bring into this, this series. And it was, it's the athletes, and it was difficult when we were shaping the structure, more difficult to find a chronology to follow the athletes along the road to 2012 in parallel with the facilitators. There is a, a natural chronology with the facilitators. With the athletes, we asked ourselves, how do you become an Olympian? And the first answer was inspiration. First, you're inspired to take up the sport. So we invited Bettina to make photographs of athletes around the theme of inspiration. And the other two um, in the following commissions were talent. You have to be talented and someone nurtures your talent. And the third one is team. When you're finally coming up to the Olympic selection process, you have a team supporting you. Um, and for inspiration, I invited Bettina to make a portrait as if the viewer was meeting the athlete. So it was as if it could be a face-to-face, a, -face, a body -to body encounter. We wanted somebody because of the physicality of the athlete. So, very direct. Bettina worked 10 by 8 on film, and her interest is in scrutinizing the sitter, scrutinizing the face, and that, I felt, would really give us this sense of, of, the, of, of the meeting, of the encounter. And her life, she really flattened her lighting, and was very, very particular about location. She went up the night before each sitting and travelled around the area with her assistant and husband, who's also a photographer, and just looked for the place that was right for Bettina. And this is on the beach near where Tom Daly lives. He's world champion diver. He was 16 at the time. And what also interested me in, his work, in her work is how you're initially peripherally aware of, of the physicality of the athlete. And the longer you spend with the portrait, the more you start to digest and understand that. Um, and what's interesting about Tom Daly, and is actually really important in terms of his Olympic ambition and his status as an athlete, is the size of his hands. As a diver, big hands cut more precisely into the water. So that's, that's his advantage. With, the, with Bettina's portrait, part of the thinking was that we'd interview each athlete and ask them who or what inspired them. And that ran alongside the, as an installation in the gallery. So you had the voice of the athletes as well as their presence. And we have that on, on our website. And um, if it's time at the end, I have one I can show you. I couldn't put it in the presentation. Uh, this is a portrait from the National Portrait Gallery Collection. It kind of sums up what Bettina was looking for. It's complete symmetry. Complete, the flatness and the symmetry. And um, I'll just go back to Tom. Tom is very beautiful and what she picked up on was how symmetrical his face was. This is one of the strongest portraits. Um, and here you'll see that again, that how she positions her sitters. Um, one of the problems we have with this project, and 
appropriate time to tell you, is issues of branding. Because we're an IOC accredited project, we can't show any branding that isn't, isn't an IOC top tier sponsor. And top athletes have their own sponsors, and some of those sponsors are not top tier athletes. So, for example, no cyclist would agree to be photographed without wearing um, Sky sponsorship. We cannot include Sky sponsorship. We had to think very hard about how we worked our way around this. And we can photograph cyclists because they're our strongest sport. And this is um, Victoria in a dress that um, Bettina sourced for her. And again, so the physicality, those extraordinary arms and hands. And here you see, this is one of the photos that we are making, both um, the assistants and I, during the shoot, documenting the process of making the portrait. And here you see Bettina with um, the sheet from her 10x8 film, actually centering up uh, Jessica Ennis, the heptathlete. She also checks two boxes. One, Bettina's quite small, petite. One box she often stands on, and one the sisters often stand on. They're multi-purpose, they carry things. And this is the final portrait of Jessica. Um, and this gives you a very good sense of Bettina's background. She actually found backgrounds that gave a sense of, I think, 19th century studio portraiture. This was grass going up a very steep hill, like a wall of grass. And the way she's lit it, they just use ring flash, her and David, has really a very, very precise um, lighting. So they travel, I don't know if I've got it here, they travel with this gazebo. So it creates the studio space as well and, and helps with the lighting. And um, this is Ola Abedogan, um, a young Paralympic hopeful. We invited different, not only across cross Olympic sports, not only medalists, but people at different career stages. So you've got a real sense of this journey because it's not only the medalists setting out to try and win another medal. It's the young, it's the upcoming athletes as well and we really wanted to reflect that. Some of the medalists aren't going to medal this year, this in 2012, and some of the young people coming through, uh, profiles will change. And it's another um, document of, of, of Bettina's methodology. She always puts a postage stamp on the forehead of her sitter. So it's kind of a portrait within a portrait. So she focuses on that. Um, and this is Rebecca Addington. Again, that kind of serenity. It's a very meditative and quite demanding process thing. But I'd say meditative for the viewer, demanding for the sitter to be photographed by um, Bettina. It's the slowness of it and the precision of it. And the, the shutter speed is relatively slow. So, so I'll just go back to that one. So you, again, you see that her use of background and the stillness of, of the sitter. And it's another a Paralympian. Uh, the most, I'd say, a descriptive of the portrait. What she, Bettina was trying to do here was continue a line through the portrait. So this was photographed on the beach near where Nathan Stevens lives. He's a discus thrower. Um, and the line of the horizon and the sea and then the wall that Nathan was standing in front of. And this, I think, is the final, the final image by um, Bettina. And it's by a young woman boxer. Women's boxing is in the Olympic Games for the first time this year. And Savannah is a medal hopeful. She found it very difficult. She was light phobic, but it's something about the, the extraordinary strength of athletes, not only the fact that she stood there, but the way she stood. It's that perfect physique, the core strength, and standing so, so beautifully still. And the length of her arms is something else I want to comment on. Something that you come to after looking at her face. As a boxer, your reach is important. She's very tall. Um, I don't know in metres. One, 
point, I'm going to say 1.89. Anyway, big, tall, and strong. Um, these extraordinary arms. And in the editing process, Bettina only makes 10 frames, which is pretty courageous. When you know you have to, you have to get something, because we won't, we don't get access the second time to these sitters. And, um, in these ten frames, Bettina usually says there's only one. In these there were two. But we went for this one because it told you so much about her as the athlete, the thought, and her advantage. We installed, we were very clear that we wanted to install these series as two very separate bodies of work. So they hung in adjacent rooms. They printed at different sizes. Brian were all different. He used two sizes, maybe more. But Tina had a constant size, not that big. Um, and again, I only know in inches. They were framed differently. Each room was painted a different colour. So dealt with in very different ways, but they were interconnecting rooms. And I really liked the way the two bodies were, kind of spoke to each other through the space. There's a tension between them. They work so very differently. When you think of Brown's drama and his lighting, and Bettina's removal of drama. And this is the main um, hall coming into the gallery. So we announced the, the exhibition and the two bodies of work on this wall. So on the, the yellow wall, you'll see Brown, and we use one very big image of the Kenny family, so the steel workers family. And on the right, two of Bettina's. And those colours were held down, down in the two galleries as well, so that also helped separate them. And this is the commission that I'm now working on, it's live. So the work, the first body of work is still actually not finalised. It's, it's in post-production and what you're seeing is what we have currently got. It, so this second year is called Changing Pace, so the change of pace along this road to 2012. And I uh, started with the athlete this, this year. I was wiser. I knew how difficult it was to get access to athletes. We sometimes waited months, and they were nail-biting months the first time. And uh, we invited Finley Mackay, who's one of the, I'd say, young, emerging talents. His creatively conceived and highly crafted work really singles him out as, a, as a, a leading talent in his generation. He's slightly younger than Bettina. And the work is so very different, as you'll see. Um, his is informed by graphics. He orig originally, he started, um, he read fine art at university in Glasgow and um, started and really loved to draw. And then started working on 10 by 8 film and drawing into that. And when he assisted in London, he assisted one of the top women photographers, Elaine Constantine, who came through the club scene. He worked with her. And that's when he started working digitally. And he um, made his name with his first commercial job, which was an ad campaign for Diesel. And his work is full of energy. And um, it's loud and it's brash. And it's, it's funny, or what he called weird sometimes. He, he likes weird. And it's very much informed by graphic novels. He has a broad portfolio. He does um, sport, art, portraiture, as well as the very complex, complex advertising campaigns. But this is what I'd seen of his. I'd found online. <coughs> um, and it was made for New York Times magazine. He does a lot of editorial work as well. And I found what the New York Times magazine commissions actually is really... Um, a strong resource, fabulous work. And I thought this was stunning. And for this series, I thought this will be the series when we see the athlete doing their thing. They will be doing their sport in the way that in Bettina's they weren't able to. That did mean we were very careful with the athletes we chose. We looked across a broad range of sports, but also checked... Um, their branding and their sponsorship had to. No cyclists in this one. But when I um, Finley came in to talk and meet and we discussed it, and actually it helped my thinking about how we might 
photograph the athletes not only alone doing their thing, but with the person who'd mentored them, who'd nurtured their talent, or who was kind of underpinning their Olympic ambition. And um, we invited the sitters to nominate those people. Then they came back with another solution. He came back with pretty complex, almost theatre scenes, scenarios, beautifully lit and wonderful narratives. So this is, um, and this isn't cropped yet, so these, I would say, maybe up to 50, no, it's difficult, a very large percent of Finley's work happens in post-production. He works digitally, and he shoots around the, around the city. So for this, he would have shot the street above the house, blue sky, snow, there was snow on the ground. There would be, he would have enough frames to do what he calls stitching together the final image. And um, we did photograph them separately, and then we looked at photographing together in front of the house with this uh, Aaron Cook, the World Taekwondo number one in his weight, lived. He nominated his mother, his father, and his brother as the people that were enabling his Olympic ambition. They'd all moved to this house from the south of England up to the north because it's near the centre of excellence. And this is Aaron doing his signature kick in the drive of their houseway. And it tells a lot about the grassroots of the sport. It is these parents who've been burying Aaron around for since he was five when he started. And um, we filmed them talking about that. So we're continuing the filming and we'll be showing that in the gallery and online. And this, this is another image, again a really um, brilliant grassroots story of where boxes, boxes, so many boxes come from really deprived areas in the UK. And this is in one of the most marginalised areas of Birmingham in the Midlands. It's largely Muslim and it's in the back of a church hall. It's funded entirely by this boxing club. And the man in the, the boxer in the red helmet is an Olympic medalist hope. And leaning on the pillar is his coach, an Irishman, Frank O'Sullivan, who founded this club. Um, the, the boxer, Khalid Yafai, is first generation Yemeni. His mother brought him up, she was a single parent, she brought him up alone, one of six siblings, and his brother's also in this club. And when this, we'll use this image very big, and it's full of stories of that place. Khalid is at the centre of training in the centre of excellence four days a week, and he goes back to Birmingham for two days training with Frank. So what we're getting is quite complex stories. And I talk about the experience of being there in the audio blog. One of the pleasures of spending time with the photographers is the stories they tell me about what, what's inspired them, things that have come up. Tim is quite shy, but um, after we photographed Khalid and he put together, we were looking at all the frames, uh, hundreds of them, selecting the different parts. And that image you've just seen is made up of so many different parts. And we talked about this um, painting by the American painter George Bellows. And this gives you some idea of the way Finley shows us some of the work initially. This is um, two brothers, they're both triathletes, with their trainer up in the Yorkshire Moors, where they grew up and where they still train. And we went, it was one of the first in the project, we went up there. And Finley again shot around the subject. He shot, the, you can see, sky, moors, and the incredible view. And it is quite a monumental work, I think, and relates back to some of the history of paintings with, with landscape and story. And this is the, fin this is the final image that he's, um, we just received last week. And I, we're happy with this. We'll keep it. And with the Yafai one. The Aaron Cook, I think, needs to go in tighter. The car, weren't, weren't so happy with. But obviously this is all in discussion with Finley because it is his work. 
there came a point when we realised um, we couldn't bring everybody together in one frame, and that was when we were photographing wheelchair rugby. And the athlete, um, Mandip, on the left, with a ball in his hand, nominated his mother. And we looked at them in the same frame, and it didn't really make sense. So we decided to separate them and hang them as side by side as diptych. This is, for me, one of the most compelling portraits, and I found it thrilling when I, I saw it happening. Uh, Philip Saiduru is a uh, world champion. I'm not sure if he still holds it, triple jumper. And we had to wait a long time to photograph him because such a large proportion of his training is not actually triple jumping. And he was months when he wasn't doing it. We went up to Birmingham and we watched him triple jump. And he was not comfortable and he didn't really want to be doing this for us. And so we stopped. And then he stopped his training and he was going to give us time to work with him. And we were observing him and noticed he spent a lot of time talking to his trainer. He spent more time talking to his trainer than he did training. And we brought over the box to the stand. And the, if you watch triple jumping, you'll know that stand is critical. And the raking of the stand after the jump, so that the surface is, is, is safe. So we knew the stand was important. And Finley Lippitt, he uses up to six lights and two assistants. So they're really high production. And we had them sitting on the box talking. And it was very engaging. And then Philip started to stand on the box and started jumping. And there's just this one, mo one image where he's absolutely upright. And... Um, Finley shot about six, and then he stopped. We can't make them do it. They, they're trained, and they, the point's when they're not going to work with you anymore. And so this is, the, this is the only choice we had. We think it's beautiful, but because he's moving, it's very slightly soft. So it's only so big it will go. I think it'll go pretty big. We've, we've experimented with how it doesn't go that big. It goes about, it'll go about that big, but... An image, we'll keep that full frame. So, for an image that size, you, you can start to imagine the scale it will be. There's another, way, another um, sitting where it was impossible to photograph. It was impossible to make a powerful picture of the trainer, of the coach, Jürgen Grobler, the legendary rowing coach. And rowing's another very strong um, British sport. They're very good at sitting down sports, cycling, rowing, sailing. Um, it was impossible to do anything that wasn't a traditional rowing sports photograph in the circumstances and to get Jürgen Grobler in. It, it was very windy and after the, the rowers had finished rowing, they agreed to come out on an area of water just behind the actual strips that they compete on. It was extremely helpful and pretty brave of them too because the boat, boats are extremely valuable and there was, the wind was blowing them up against the, marsh, uh, the, the rushes and very shallow water. What Finley had done was lit, got, put light in those rushes and you don't get half the sense of it here. But it is glorious, it's really painterly, that sky and that vegetation. And we've agreed to keep that format for this, for this image. And probably hang them, I'm not quite sure how we'll hang them, side by side. Side by side are one under the, the other. That's something we'll be looking at next week. But something I was very aware of at this stage, certainly when working with Finley, that how the increasing number of really good sports photography that's around. And I was very clear that we didn't need to go that route for two reasons. One, because we can acquire it. And two, because in doing it, doing it the sports tour is another way. We're picking up on, on narratives that aren't necessarily in the public domain. We're visualising the stories. Um, 
And also the row of settlers, the best row portraits of the camera that's strung on a wire over their heads. As the swimmers said, the best swimming portraits are the ones under the water when they're competing. Um, and this is the final diptych that Finley made. These are three sailors, uh, three women sailors, and it's a new Olympic class. And there was no wind that day. It wouldn't have been possible to go out with them. But also Finley's light. I think he had at least four with him, big lights, and the soft box. And it really would have been impossible to work in with this approach, this really high-end approach in the, in the water. Finley did go into the water himself, both the, for the boat rowers and the sailors. And I have a whole series of portraits of Finley wading in waist deep into the water. He just goes for it. He's very, like all of them, very, very determined, but they're all determined in very different ways to get what they want. And the final photographer we've worked with in year two is Emma Hardy. And um, I haven't got any other examples of her work. Probably she, she's done a previous project commission for the National Portrait Gallery um, of young, young people at the top of their game. So I'll go, um, I'll go straight into um, the work she's made for us. Emma really pairs down to the essentials. Film in her camera, she, she still works on film, so we have two photographers working digitally and two film at the moment. And most of the time, ambient light. So light is important to all of them, obviously, but Emma's very precise about the time of day she photographs and where she photographs, and she checks the locations beforehand. I w and where her strength lies, and I think it comes from her having been an actor previously. She started photography in eight, and she said, I know what it feels like to be scrutinized, and I try to make sure that my subjects feel comfortable. And it's that focus on creating the relationship her empathy and building up an intimacy that enables her to get what she wants, that, that really single out her work. And she is um, the most brilliant terrier, just for making sure she goes through all those barriers of people in front offices, stopping and getting to their boss, their, their, our sitters. And Emma finds a way through charm, through tenacity, through all her resources, and you can see here, she's a delightful person, um, to speak to the sitter beforehand. And she, through the phone, she gets them on side, she wins them over. So, for example, she persuaded the director of Paralympic Integration, who is responsible for making sure that the Olympic and the Paralympics are both given the same status in London 2012. She persuaded him to um, have his portrait taken in the swimming pool. He's blind, he'll never see it. He's an ex-Paralympian swimmer, but no longer has the body of the Paralympian swimmer. And it was very, it says a lot for both Emma and him and the relationship they built um, that, that he agreed to do this. He'll never see the portrait, but it was important to him that we sent it over and had it described to him. And he talked of the sitting with Emma, um, and I was described it in the audio blog, about how there was complete consynchronicity, how it flowed between them. I think it's, um, it's one I'm very pleased with. And it is um, a genre of photography, another genre of photography, this ambient light, kind of um, a gentleness. And these are two... Um, young people, really marginalised, um, who were on the Young Leaders Programme that was in the 2012 bid, that would take marginalised young people and offer them programmes that would establish their confidence and give them a skill set, um, so that they'd be in a position to volunteer for London 2012. And we went to Scotland to photograph them, um, to Aberdeen, because we really wanted to bring in as much of the country as possible um, into the locations. 
Again, Emma went up the day early and she walked the beach and looked for the time when she would get the light she needed and met the sitter, the woman, the day ahead. The young man we'd invited didn't turn up. He left early and didn't turn up. And that, that's so much um, a, a result of, of his own difficulties. And this other one stood in at the last minute. And because of that, Emma felt there wasn't the relationship between them. They didn't really know each other. So we agreed that she would photograph them separately and we'd go for the most compelling portraits and we'd hang, we'll hang them together. And we're doing that throughout Emma's series. She's photographing people together and separately. Her sitters are possibly the most difficult. They are men in suits. They're the people making staging a game, so actually making it happen. So what we agreed to do, Emma talked about the authentic person and very beautifully described asking them to fall into their natural grace. And I am personally suspicious of the word authenticity because I think it's contingent. So I said much more pragmatically, let's say we're going to photograph them out of the office in places where they do their thinking or find their inspiration. And so Emma taught them through that, and they were all up for it. And this is the chief executive of London 2012, the private company that, that's staging the games. Um, and this is, is photographed at home, so quite neutral. We did have one which has more sense of place in the story, but we were the lighting force, well, and the sense of him is, is very strong in this. And we will be cropping it. This is not the final crop. Um, this is the director of branding for London 2012 in the white shirt and Michael Mopurgo who is a very high profile children's writer and Greg Nugent the director of branding invited him to write the script for the animated films that have been made for children around the mascots for London 2012 and this pub is in Devon where Michael Mopurgo lives and it's where Greg Nugent, the branding director, and Michael had their first meeting and um, talked about Michael working on London 2012. And another triptych. This is the team who will be um, creating the opening ceremony. So incredibly important people. If there's one thing that the majority of people will watch, it's the opening ceremony. And this is Danny Boyle. I don't know if he's an internationally known film and theatre director. He was insistent that he had his designers with them. And we pushed back because we do control, we do think about who we want to invite. And he said, no, you're not hearing me, my designers. And I'm so pleased we did because this is where I hear really the other stories. The young woman on the right, um, Sutra Lalab, said, it's almost unthinkable to work with, uh, work, not to work with Danny. We're like a think tank. He breaks down boundaries. He uses us not as decorators. So they work seamlessly together. And um, Mark Childers is on the left with his dog who goes to the office um, is also part of this think tank. And I think there's one other that wasn't mentioned, uh, wasn't invited. Danny didn't mention him. And they're photographed at um, an old water mill which is on the River Lee that runs through the Olympic Park. And this is where the ceremony is team are working. And we'll show those in the main hall because they're the people that are really going to give out to everybody. And again, it's the story, it's the, the, the high profile Danny and the unsung, the two designers. Um, and we've looked at media. This is the um, Deborah Paulson, Australian woman who's um, commissioning editor for Channel 4, who are host broadcasters for the Paralympics. And this, the host broadcasters, the BBC, for the Olympic Games. So there's the man who heads it up in the blue shirt, and one of the journalists, who is pretty investigative and has traced the Olympic, uh, right from Olympic history, the IOC history. And on the left, Sue Barker, who's probably the best-known anchorwoman for sports in the UK. And the last two slides I'm going to show. Um, he is head of security for the London Metropolitan Police, photographed at home in his uniform in front of his table tennis table. And in the background, you can see his toy train set. 
I find something very engaging um, about that. And finally, one of the most powerful portraits. Um, these are the commercial set directors. Of, well, the one on the right is the commercial director. The one on the left um, is another director in another area, but part of that commercial team. And because of the issue around British men sitting comfortably together, and because there's a sense of hierarchy here, we photographed them in the back of the car, and that was very strategic. And we find it one of the most powerful photographs. And when sitters ask, we do show them their portrait and make clear that as a national institution with a collection, we have to have editor maintain editorial control. And I heard yesterday here, yeah, I was so pleased that um, they're comfortable with this. And this is how you can see it all so far. It is a live project and it's been really helpful for me to actually think through it all here and just pull back a bit. I'm very aware of what I think are gaps in our different approaches and who we'll be commissioning, or possibly who we will commission next year. It's much easier to brief. Now that as the project builds up, it's easier to find a direction and kind of focus a brief or focus the discussions we'll have with the photographers on our list. But also, of course, the other key player in all this is the audience, the people that are going to see these and, and interpret them. So I'm really eager to hear your responses. That's it. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for these stories about portraits and, uh, and you know, and, and you know, to, to, to sharing. Thank you for sharing with us uh, the, the actual setting of the portrait. We're running a bit late of time, actually. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. okay. No, no, we. I mean, it's uh, it's very difficult to sort of you know stick to the time. So I, yo creo que estamos que quedándonos un poco tiempo. Ya me han regañado. Yo me toca a mí hacer de de mala de la película, pero bueno, vamos a dejar abiertas dos preguntas, ¿vale? Si alguien tiene algo que comentar y luego Ann estará por aquí si le queréis preguntar más cosas en concreto, ¿vale? Then, abrimos, I said two questions and then yeah. the pieces of how to meet, etc. Well, thank you for your patience and listening so long. To... No, there's one question there. Um, I'll ask the question in English. Uh, can I ask the question in English? ¿Puedo hacer la pregunta en inglés o, o la traduzco? ¿Hay traducción? Sí, hay una traducción, sí. Hay traducción, no, o sea que no hay ningún problema. Um, first of all, Anne, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Congratulations on your marvelous project. Um, I'd like to know to what extent you're actually photographing the reaction of the people being photographed instead of actually photographing the people, so to speak. In other words, the photograph of Brian Griffin with the three men who didn't like to be too close to each other, um, the, the jumper or whatever he was, the person who, who did the jumps, uh, who didn't like to be photographed. Are you actually photographing their reaction or carrying out their actual task or, or whatever, their, their role in the Olympics. We Sorry. are, I'm saying they, they are portraits. Uh -huh. So it's not a reaction to being photographed. The athlete, the jumper, um, had trained. He didn't want to jump anymore. And we couldn't get a portrait of him jumping. What I'm aware of is that there'll be many portraits of him jumping. There won't be portraits of him and that relationship between his coach and him. And he didn't do that jump for us. He did that jump because he wanted to jump. Mm -hmm. He said, and now you've got me jumping. Okay. So it was what he does in downtime. Okay. 
And with Brian, I would say, Brian picks up, he allows the sitters to interact, and then he freezes them. So he waits until they do something. They're not necessarily reacting to him. They are in a, they are aware of being photographed. But, for example, the man that put his hands up to his coat, mm-hmm. when, you're, when you're standing somewhere, it's very few people are able to let, let their hands just hang. There will be emotion involved. Something happens. Mm-hmm. And it's that something that happens that Brian uses to build a portrait. And he will say, if I question him, because I sometimes do it, but how do we substantiate this? He said, um, my task is to make a compelling portrait, a compelling image, mm-hmm. to draw people in and look. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Una última pregunta, antes de irnos, por ahí hay una pregunta. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, yo quería preguntarte, por lo que nos has explicado, he notado que la galería tiene, eh, digamos, eh, mucha intervención en la realización de las, de las fotografías. De hecho, el control mayor lo lleváis vosotros. ¿Esto puede suponer en algún momento un conflicto con el fotógrafo a la hora de planificar mm, lo que es la fotografía en sí? Um, no, we always do everything in discussion with the photographer. And if the photographer is unhappy with an image, if in the selection process, we edit together. So the director, the photographer, me, curator of photographs, and another project member, all edit with the photographer. And it's a very important question to ask him because who controls it? Um, we are a cord. If we are not a cord, then the photographer's voice and the director's voice are critical and the director won't agree anything that the photographer's not happy with. So we see, and that's the complexity of this commission. It is with, with Commissioning, almost like commercial work, but we're aware they're making a body of work, the photographers. It is a series, so of which, and it is artwork. So it's quite, it's quite complex. We have a lead, but they have a visual, a visual language and a voice, if that makes sense to you. I hope. So we would never overrule a photographer, our artist. And one of the things is the gallery is the integrity with which they relate to their artists. Muy bien, pues muchas gracias por la mañana tan larga y a las cuatro nos vemos, ¿vale?